social medicine it is and can be, as you just got the reminder, uh, this meeting will be recorded. Uh, and so if you don't want yourself to be recorded, just turn off your video and listen. Uh, and then these recordings we make available for people who haven't been able to come, so it's a useful service to provide for them. Uh, today we have another pair of excellent speakers uh, who will focus our attention on the problem of tuberculosis. As anyone in the field of social medicine knows, this is the disease that has really been the defining disease for the field of social medicine since the 19th century. And we have the good fortune to have two experts in different aspects of the disease with us today. So the first speaker is Carol Mitnick, uh, who is our newest minted professor of global health and social medicine, uh, having received her official promotion just in the past few weeks. Uh, and so it's wonderful to have this opportunity uh, to celebrate uh, Carol's achievement in this respect. Uh, so she is now, I can introduce her as a professor of global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School and an associate epidemiologist in the Center Division of Global Health Equity at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. She has more than 20 years of experience in programmatic support, research, policy, and advocacy related to increased access to high quality and appropriate treatment for tuberculosis, especially for drug-resistant tuberculosis. Her contributions to the field have come through national, I'm sorry, observational and experimental research all in close collaboration with Partners in Health and its various clinical sites. She is currently the co-principal investigator of two multi-country phase three randomized controlled clinical trials of all oral shortened novel regimen for rifampin resistant tuberculosis. Carol has worked over her career in multiple Partners in Health partner in other countries, especially Peru, Haiti, Kazakhstan, Congo, Lesotho, uh, helping to scale up MDRTB treatment throughout the world. Uh, she received her master's and doctoral training in international health epi epidemiology and ecology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Now, Salman, I will just give a very brief introduction to you because he's one of the co-conveners for the seminar series, so you should all know him well by this point. He's a physician and anthropologist uh, who is also a professor of global health and social medicine in this department and also in the Division of Global Health Equity at the Brigham as a hospitalist and clinician. Of his many accomplishments, the ones most relevant for his role as discussant today is his long work as a clinician and program builder devoted to the control of tuberculosis, especially multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. <clears throat> he has worked extensively on building treatment programs, again, largely but not exclusively through partners in health in Africa and Asia, especially in Russia. And then from 2007 to 2010, he was chair of World Health Organization's Project Greenlight program which was an effort to scale up the treatment of MDR-TB uh, for populations worldwide. So we have expertise both from the side of ep epidemiology and also from the side of clinical treatment for tuberculosis. And I'm sure you are all looking forward to hearing their talks as much as I am. So I'll turn it over to them. Carol. Great. Thanks, David. Um, thanks, Marty and um, Salman for organizing this and the opportunity to uh, speak um, among, sorry, I'm having a little trouble. I had this set up before. Um, speak in this series. Um, and I know I've been really preceded and will be succeeded by um, luminaries. I'm totally privileged to uh, call my colleagues. And let me try this one more time. All right, I am going to hope that you can now see my slides. We can, Carol, it looks good. Right, and can you still see my slides? We still can. Great, all right, thank you. So um, today I'm gonna share some high level thoughts with you about an area in which I've really toiled in the weeds my entire career with PIH and HMS. Um, using the example of the need for innovation um, for patients with drug-resistant TB, I'm going to talk about how knowledge in the form of global guidelines for drug-resistant tuberculosis is generated, how it's suffused with meaning by those who control access to and the use of that information, how its use really perpetuates the supremacy of colonial powers in global health and also limits access, ultimately limits access to that innovation required to save lives. 
Um, it won't be an inherently technical talk, but I will provide a couple of examples of technical challenges um, that emanate from this kind of control of knowledge. And it won't all be doom and gloom. I'm gonna just share some of the solutions, both technical and structural, um, that we know could help accelerate the delivery of innovation. And I, I really just want to acknowledge that this, this epistemological constraint I recognize is only one of many, many constraints on um, equity and access to and, and good outcomes from healthcare. But I just want to shine the light on, on this part of it today for this, for this pro seminar. Um, and throughout, you'll see I'm going to draw uh, gratefully from um, the work by many of my colleagues and um, mentors and students um, and, and people at PIH and in the department and, and beyond. And so starting with this, this first um, article, this paper um, led by our own Carly Rodriguez was a, is a mixed methods analysis of barriers and facilitators to early access to the first new anti-TB drugs that um, came to market in more than 50 years. Um, it includes an excerpt of a case which was the story of a, of a young man with diabetes and treatment recalcitrant drug resistant TB. His TB had been treated repeatedly between 2013 and 2015. Um, in, in one case, it had included um, the new one of the new anti-TB drugs, Bedaquiline, which was first approved by a stringent regulatory authority, the US Food and Drug Administration, um, in 2012. And despite good adherence to that regimen and good control of his diabetes, um, his, his TB disease did not respond to that third um, regimen containing the one that contained Bedaquilin. And his providers sought reinforcement to that regimen, including the addition of the second um, new anti-TB drug to come to market, Delaminid, which was approved by the kind of partner stringent regulatory authority in Europe, the uh, European Medicines Agency in 2013. It was only after several months, um, a number of kind of bureaucratic hurdles of getting IRB approvals and regulatory approvals and paying fees for, the, for those reviews, getting the um, clinicians, getting redundant trainings in pharmacovigilance and multiple external consultations um, with a European uh, TB concilium made of, of efforts from Western Europe, could these providers in Southern Africa get delaminid for uh, Calvin to uh, complete his treatment? And so today I really am going to try to um, share with you some thoughts on what the, the, the um, structures around the development of knowledge are that, that made it so complicated for Calvin to get a good drug that his doctors knew that he needed, um, and um, also how Calvin's situation fits into a larger, a larger epidemiologic context. So this um, is a map the WHO produces every year when they do a new global TB report. This is the 2020 version. So it's showing the estimated percent of um, multi-drug resistant or rifampin resistant TB as the percentage of new TB cases globally. And I just wanna make a couple of points. Um, one, you can see that the countries um, in which regulatory authority or regular, sorry, authorization was sought and received, so Western Europe and the US um, for these new drugs, the um, reported prevalence of drug resistant TB is among is is in the lowest category around the world. In contrast, where Calvin actually was receiving his treatment in Southern Africa, you can see the prevalence is higher. And in other parts of the world where many of us work, so Central and Eastern Europe and Central and Eastern Asia, the prevalence of drug resistant TB is much much higher than where those drugs were were approved. Um, in this um, figure, it just gives you another sense of um, the, the uh, disparity. So this gives you a, a, an 
idea of the numbers of data points that countries actually have to estimate their prevalence. So really how good, how good are those estimates? And again, you can see that in the places where the drugs were approved, where there's very little drug resistant TB, there's the most data to produce those estimates. And in the places where we know there's an enormous amount of TB and we suspect that there is a lot of drug resistant TB, there's much less data and in, in many, many cases, none or only very old data to produce those estimates. So we're seeing, not surprisingly, something we've seen before, which is that the resources are, are concentrated in the places where they're perhaps needed the least. Um, uh, in this figure um, produced by uh, an advocacy organization called DRTB STAT, um, involvement uh, by many, many in, in the Global Health Delivery Partnership, um, it just gives you some sense of the magnitude of the gap between the needs of patients like Calvin and those receiving any care, especially care that avails of these aforementioned treatment um, innovations. So just a reminder that Bedaquiline was approved by the FDA in 2012 and delaminated by the EMA in 2013. Um, and while uh, more than a million people were estimated to need treatment for drug resistant TB in uh, 2015 and 2016, um, about half of which were uh, estimated to need bedaquilin and delaminid, only about 10% actually received um, those drugs. So the gap um, uh, remains uh, enormous uh, in in uh, filling that, that particular need for innovation. And I'm gonna try to uh, describe how the process of, of knowledge generation contributes to that gap. Um, so the first guidelines, um, periodically the World Health Organization issues guidelines for um, various uh, health conditions. And um, the first guidelines for the on the treatment or on the management of drug resistant TB were issued by the World Health Organization in 1997. And they were written by these three um, by these three men, Sir John Crofton and Drs. Pierre Cholet and Dermot Maher. Um, and I, I just want to um, give you a tiny bit of their background just to, to, to help shape an understanding of, of who really controlled uh, the information put forth in these guidelines. So Wikipedia describes um, Sir John Crofton as having been born in Dublin to a quote unquote well-off Anglo-Irish family. He was a graduate of the you know, very elite um, University of Cambridge in the UK. He was also um, perhaps infamous for uh, his recommendations in the 1960s against the use of the recently discovered and highly expensive rifampin, despite its um, contribution to more effective treatment, its low efficacy, excuse me, its low toxicity and ease of administration. The second um, member of this writing team, Dr. Pierre Cholet, was uh, described in a glowing tribute um, after his death by an Algerian compatriot as born to quote unquote Catholic parents and quote unquote, having been educated entirely in, in Algeria. Um, her description goes on to mention that he had um, been militant against colonial injustice in Algeria and after being expelled from Algeria, proceeded to defend his doctorate in the capital of the colonial power, France. So clearly these are people who had access to the halls of power, both clearly privileged men whose status as TB experts permitted them to, to write these guidelines. Um, in the um, in this 1997 edition, there were no pre-specified questions. There was no transparency about the process or, oops, sorry. There was no transparency about the process or the disclosures or, or any disclosures. And the guidelines really effectively represented just a dogma um, about how drug resistant TB treatment did not fit into a one size fits all standard. And although they were ostensibly guidelines for the management of drug resistant TB, they effectively recommended against its treatment. 
And this gives us really the first glimpse of into ownership and, and control of the knowledge bestowed by the drug resistant TB um, guidelines. And this was the, these were the, the kind of standing guidelines at the time that um, Partners in Health um, convened a meeting of all the luminaries in TB to draw attention to the problem of drug resistant TB and, and to the feasibility and moral of and the moral imperative to treat it in resource poor settings. I'm gonna play about a two minute clip from um, this meeting. It's from the movie Bending the Arc. Um, it will be all audio because Netflix won't let me stream on Zoom, but but much of it is actually audio in the movie anyhow. And there are there is narration by uh, Paul Farmer, Jim Kim, and Joya Mukherjee, and I hope this works. <laughs> Let's see. So we brought together the big shots of TB and got them into this one room. It was Howard Hyatt's idea to do it with the express notion of taking on the policy. Once the WHO announced that they would come, all of the good and the great in TB control came. At that time, we were a very small NGO with a small clinic in Conj, 75 patients in Peru. You know, Jim, who was still moonlighting at the Brigham to pay a salary. I mean, it was just like we were little bitty we were small potatoes. And then we presented the results. And the results really, I think, were shocking to people. I looked at your data and was quite struck by the suggestion that uh, there was over 50% cure rate. That I, I just have a hard time accepting that those numbers will float on challenge. The vast majority of the TV community literally lost their minds. Look at the results we just heard. 70% of cases are cured. My belief is that those 70% never had multiple drug resistance TV. They were both, they took some of the pills that were in the blister pack, some were pumped, some were sold. If you've never been in any of these countries, you realize that their ability to screw up the program stems all the way from the top, all the way down to the bottom. The old school TV crowd was furious. How important is it to treat multiple drug-related TV? I don't think it's very important at all. I don't think it has very much of an impact. You know, even if we believe it, you can't do it. Maybe it's a good idea, but where and when and, and for how long? You need to think about sustainability. I've never seen this debate play itself out among patients saying, you know, I don't really think I'm sustainable. In time. So I'm sorry, every time I listen to that clip, it, it, um, it moves me to tears. I, for those of you who haven't seen um, the movie Bending the Arc, it is available on Netflix and I would um, strongly in, encourage you to watch it. But this, um, these guidelines basically were, were just channeling the opinion of the people who had the floor or the people who could scream the loudest. Um, the, um, the next guidance I, I'm um, conscious, co conscious of mentioning also sort of reflected who could scream the loudest. And in that case, it was the message that uh, you heard from uh, Jim and Paul at that meeting and that there was a moral imperative to treat drug resistant TB and it was feasible. Um, ultimately, uh, the World Health Organization decided that it probably wasn't um, the best way to generate policy just to have this kind of back and forth between experts um, and, and their opinions. And so in 2003, they produced their first uh, guidelines for guidelines, uh, which um, really placed a priority on um, evidence-based uh, guidance, on um, holding the population as most important in comp comparison to individual patients. But notably, um, they, that, that the importance of that evidence or the population could effectively be suppressed if limited resources were an issue or feasibility uh, were appeared to, to uh, the intervention um, being recommended appeared to be infeasible. Um, the uh, this 
attempt to try to um, further define the process of developing guidelines, and this was for everything, not just for drug-resistant TB, continued with a, a new publication in 2012 and a second edition in 2014. And these guidelines were much more pre prescriptive. Um, they really established a, a, a commitment to a systematic review of evidence intending for that evidence to be clinical trials, um, the use of the grade process, which I'll talk about in a minute. And it really emphasized uh, transparency in process and participation. And in particular, the declaration of potential conflicts of interest. And these uh, bullets at the bottom are the kinds of conflicts, uh, are the kinds of interests that they insist that anybody involved in the guidelines process declare. And they really try to exclude people who have any of these interests. And that includes, as you can see, a publication or conduct of a study that is part of the evidence base under consideration, meaning excluding the very people who might actually have expertise. They exclude people who have taken a position, like written an editorial, for example, arguing about the um, feasibility or imperative to treat drug-resistant TB, or working with an organization, say like Partners in Health, which is trying to increase access to that treatment. So these people are explicitly uh, intended to be excluded or at least muzzled by having to declare an interest um, uh, related to participation in this process. So this grade process that was really kind of elevated in the WHO guidelines to guidelines, I'm just going to um, go through very briefly this complicated diagram of what the grade process means, just to give you a flavor for how, how both prescriptive and proscriptive this process really is. So in short, a committee of experts is called upon to establish questions according to this PICO format, which is the P stands for population, intervention, comparator, and outcome. The outcomes are um, ranked by uh, their importance, again, by so-called experts. And then systematic reviews and meta-analyses across both published studies and unpublished um, studies are conducted to produce um, summaries of findings and effect estimates for each of the, the valued outcomes. And then there's this process of rating the quality of that evidence where clinical trials start with high as high quality evidence and might be downgraded for um, these issues. And observational research or, or data coming from programmatic studies um, start with as low quality evidence and very rarely might be um, upgraded for these reasons. So, um, the, this process really, as I mentioned, kind of um, reveres clinical trials and, and, and builds a whole structure around that valued type of evidence. And again, I just note that when the recommendations are formulated, again, cost can be considered, even though there's been this strong emphasis on evidence. So what what we see in this is it 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 it's a very you know conventional biomedical approach that um, that puts high value on experimental designs, and it it's taken to some degree at face value as some kind of truth. But the reality, like most, is that this is a socially constructed knowledge, and it it really reflects. Um, things that have been valued historically and the results of questions that have been asked historically um, and experiments that have been conducted historically that, that, that make us prioritize um, these kinds of attributes that are, are, are uh, included in this word cloud. And it's all you know, focused on the experimental model, on randomization, on the ability to um, combine these randomized uh, uh, studies in a in a systematic way and apply checklists and um, it, it really um, 
this process just concentrates and reinforces the concentration of um, Weber's rational uh, legal authority in the hands of those who define the questions, who have the levers of controls to conduct the randomized controlled trials or use the analytic methods that derive from um, those trials and, and uh, from their, their summary across uh, multiple studies. And so the, the reality of what was meant to be a transparent process is really still much of the same. It's, it's, there is a, a veneer of legitimacy with this grade process, but we still know that there are, there's you know, the puppeteer, the man behind the curtain, whatever, the baby who, who shouts the loudest, um, uh, having a, a major impact in what comes out of this process. Um, so now I'm gonna I'm gonna um, kind of go a little bit deeper into some of the the specific attributes of the process for guidelines for drug resistant TB over the last several years. Um, and one of the steps that I mentioned in the in the grade is there are these systematic reviews, and they they come from published data, and WHO also um, then asks. Uh, sub sends out calls for data from uh, both published and uh, from publications and also unpublished data, ostensibly acting on behalf of member countries. And what that generally means is that data gets sent from places where there's more TB to places where there's less TB like the US and Western Europe. And at the same time, because of the aforementioned um, declarations of interest, it effectively isolates the providers of the data that people who, who conducted the studies in country from contributing expertise. Um, and uh, nevertheless, the, the yield is huge. Um, the, the last few rounds of these calls for data have resulted in a, an individual patient database of thir about 13,000 patients from 50 countries. It is a range of uh, data in that it's a very small amount comes from clinical trials. Um, most is routine programmatic data and a small subset is from formal um, observational studies. Um, and uh, be, there, there is this, um, be, because of this mixing, um, the the uh, focus is on maximizing the number of observations used for each of the analyses that inform guidelines and kind of um, consolidating to the lowest common denominator of the completeness or quality of the data. And I'll talk more about the implications of that, that least common denominator when I talk about some of the technical problems. So just to, um, to reflect for a minute on how, um, what is the real um, representation in this guidelines process? So we talked about who, who defines what's, what's discussed. Now let's think a little bit about who, who actually does have a seat at the table. Whoops. So um, the um, people from high burden and low in income countries are um, generally underrepresented um, as authors. So you can see that um, only about um, uh, just over 20% of authors in the um, IPD meta-analysis publications come from high burden countries, while more than 30% of the data sets come from those high burden countries. And you can see that high income um, country residents are disproportionately represented among uh, the authors. This is not dissimilar to um, uh, uh, findings of uh, Bethany, um, our own colleague Bethany Het Gautier's work in looking at systematic reviews of um, senior and, and first um, authorship positions for uh, Africans conducting research with colleagues from uh, North America and Europe, where the, the distribution um, is, is similarly skewed. And then you can see that low and lower and lower middle income countries are, are disproportionately underrepresented in all parts of this in the meta-analysis, um, including data. You saw that there's very little uh, 
data on drug resistant TB in many low income countries. They're not included in authorship and they're not included on um, guidelines committees. And this is a, a, a form of supremacy um, in global health that was nicely articulated in a very recent um, article in the Lancet by Abimbola M. Pai on the need for decolonization in global health. So what would a, a, um, a, an improved um, scenario look like and how do we get uh, the, the right people at the table and in, in talking about the right sort of content. And there are a couple of examples I just wanted to mention that um, work very closely linked with the department. So our colleague Carmen Contreras, who's a psychologist who's been working in um, the um, uh, in very poor communities in Lima, Peru for the last 20 years, trying to improve um, the lived experience of people with TB and HIV and mental health. She has recently started a training program for women global health leaders. Um, the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda is doing really um, groundbreaking work to provide a curriculum, an equity-based curriculum, and also in a, a more equitable structure in terms of who's sharing information, who's receiving information. Um, and then also work done um, by Bethany and um, others uh, in, in the department to really accompany um, researchers from um, low income countries to be able to complete research projects, have first authorship, have last authorship in research projects. These are, these are sustained commitments that will really be necessary to have a, a, a different, uh, have a decolonized version of, of um, global health and, the, and its uh, effect on generation of knowledge. So um, another group that's really notably absent from um, a lot of these guidelines discussions or effectively absent are patients. So each of these um, drug resistant TB guidelines committees typically just has one um, patient representative and um, they uh, often do not have a lot of opportunity to participate in meaningful ways. And then another way that a patient, patient voice could really be introduced into these guidelines discussions is um, for the WHO to solicit research uh, that includes patients' voices and, and lived experiences. Um, in the um, last four years of guidelines that were consolidated into a single guideline with these 27 recommendations um, informed by the 13,000 uh, in, uh, individual patient uh, data base, uh, there was only one 16 patient qualitative um, study uh, commissioned around treatment preferences. And that was all that was really on the table as a primary um, source for uh, guidelines committee members to, to hear what patients said. And I don't have any, any negative comments about that study itself. In fact, it was, it was ably led by uh, our postdoc, Stephanie Law. It's just that it, it, it's really um, uh, overwhelmed by that much larger quantitative data set. And not surprisingly, real discussions, meaningful discussions of, of inequality are sort of absent um, from these guidelines discussions. The World Bank classification is used as a proxy. Um, and this is despite explicit, explicit um, encouragement for consideration of inequality in the WHO guidelines to guidelines. Um, we can do better um, uh, re uh, accompanying the, the development of research activists from um, affected communities is one of the ways in which we can amplify representation of patients. This is done really well by the Treatment Action Group in their convening of the Global TB Community Advisory Board and our partner our partners in Peru, Socios and Salud, have also convened a community advisory committee in Peru that reviews all of Socios' research projects and would really be able to um, help represent patients' voices in these conversations, given the chance. So um, I'm gonna spend a few minutes on um, some of the kind of technical and analytic challenges that stem from the, the, the um, revered 
a status of, of clinical trials and of methods that are really taken wholesale from those clinical trials to um, analyze these individual patient um, databases. And I, these, these gaps will really highlight the need to um, uh, bring different expertise to the table um, and uh, include uh, new global health researchers in, in um, have, having access to that expertise. So um, the um, drug resistant TB guidelines um, now in this very formal structure with their PICO questions, the questions effectively beg or assume experimental designs. And this is a question from the 2019 guidelines in uh, multi-drug resistant or rifampin resistant TB patients, does concurrent use of bedaquiline and delaminid safely improve outcomes when compared with other treatment regimen options otherwise conforming to WHO guidelines? And this question can be parsed in many ways. It has lots of challenges, which have been um, really um, eloquently discussed by my, my colleagues, uh, Carly Rodriguez and Molly Frankie. And I'm only gonna focus on just one exposure problem um, here in this question. Um, as worded, the question begs a comparison between a group exposed to bedaquiline and delaminid, represented here by the, the dark um, little stick figures, and a group not exposed to bedaquiline and delaminid, represented here by the light. And I have um, I have made a, a decision. I, we, I just just had to be represented in one way that the um, group that's not exposed to both is, however, exposed to bedaquiline. And um, you could easily imagine a randomized uh, design that neatly assigns patients to be either exposed or unexposed for a fixed period of time, say 24 months. And that's, that kind of fits with the question the WHO or that, that was posed in the guidelines. The reality of this um, uh, individual patient data meta-analysis that's available to answer this question um, is that it is that the exposure patterns look more like this, that say a patient, you know, three of these patients all started in month one, but one got uh, exposure to bedaquiline and delaminid for 24 months, another one for one month, another one for six months. And if you're not careful about the way um, those exposures are represented in these analyses, um, you can really end up with problems. And the, you know, kind of going from the trial approach would um, assume that these were all exposed patients, but that means really different things, as you can see. In the, the guideline process really expects you to, to infer causality from um, these messier data. And so the, the PICO question is really asking, can you attribute some difference in the outcomes between the two groups to the exposure difference in the two groups? And analysis approaches that, that, that were devised for trials and assume that neat um, exposure uh, using them on these messy data cannot surprisingly um, lead to biases. And here are just two um, examples. So in this first example, imagine that um, this yellow and purple pill is bedaquiline and it's given to a patient with drug resistant TB and HIV um, along with a bunch of other drugs in the regimen. And after about three months, uh, 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 sputum is cultured for mycobacterium tuberculosis and found to be positive. And so the clinicians decide to change the regimen and they add the red and blue pill, um, which is uh, delaminid in this case, and, and they add another drug because you never add a single drug to a failing regimen. And they follow that patient. And unfortunately, that patient has a poor treatment outcome. And you're left with the question, is this because the patient received concomitant use of bedaquiline and delaminid um, it, after six months? Or is it because of the reasons, is, is, it, is it because of this culture positivity at six months, excuse me, at uh, four months that drove that decision? And conventional methods that just use binary assignment um, can't uh, answer that, that question accurately. 
So the other, the other example is um, you take the same patient, uh, MDRTB and HIV, and imagine he starts on a regimen containing both bodapolin and delaminid and the um, other drugs in the background regimen. But after about six months, the delaminid is stopped because of some toxicity. And um, he continues on to have a successful regimen, a successful outcome. Again, is this because of the combination? Is it because the regimen was changed to avert the toxicity and permit the patient to complete treatment? The, the using the, the binary assignment um, of, of uh, yes or no to combination therapy would not allow you to answer that question in a meaningful way. So we need to use new methods and those new methods require they're not even that new anymore. We need to use better methods, I'll say. And those better methods require um, better data. And they also require people informed in the application of these methods. So here's an example of how those methods can actually really help with the sort of complexity that we have here. So this is um, an image from a cohort study of men um, living with HIV, um, and it estimated the effect of um, the initiation of AZT on mortality. And this is in the early days of the HIV epidemic, and only the sickest patients were actually getting antiretroviral therapy. And you can see when the done very conventionally and just asking, pretending it was randomized and the two groups were equal and saying who died and who didn't, there was a greater than threefold risk of dying among people who got AZT suggesting that AZT killed people. Um, when you uh, adjust for the differences, so for example, as I mentioned, AZT was given disproportionately to people who had low CD4 counts or people who had AIDS-defining illnesses, and you look for that uh, at the beginning, that attenuates the negative effect of AZT, but it still appears to be um, contributing to mortality. And then when you look at, you understand better what's happening over time, and if maybe somebody developed an AIDS-defining illness um, during the time of their follow-up, um, you uh, the direction of the effect changes, and AZT has a protective effect that's very similar to that observed in clinical trials. So this is the kind of, of innovation that's needed. It's still within the same, the same social construction of knowledge that we've been talking about, but it is a part of a technical solution to these, um, to the, the um, way these guidelines are set up and the consequences of the way they're set up. So among the consequences of, of um, you know, really, um, uh, elevating the clinical trials, but not having the right, not actually having clinical trials and using uh, data inadequately or using analysis methods inadequately to actually answer the questions that are posed. Not surprisingly, you get results that don't, um, that don't express a lot of confidence. So um, among the 49 recommendations from five WHO drug-resistant TB guidelines issued between 2011 and 2019, fully 84% of them um, were evaluated as having low certainty of evidence and 80% um, were conditional. And we know that that has serious uh, implications for the willingness of countries to take up uh, recommendations for the length of time um, required before countries will uh, up will take up uh, this innovation. Donors are not inclined, like the Global Fund is not inclined to permit inclusion of funding for innovation that was based on a conditional recommendation and the ability to negotiate for reduced pricing, say for that innovation is also compromised, ultimately leaving um, activists, patients, providers all unable to, to access that innovation. Um, I think I'm going to skip this just in the interest of time or I'll, I'll, I'll go through it really quickly. This is, as I was writing this talk, this was kind of a, a framework I came up with for how the, the, the pressures of the social construction of, of knowledge and the, the um, concentration of power in post-colonial uh, global health authorities uh, affects this whole cycle of um, 
of you know holding in esteem the the gold standard of the um, randomized controlled trial and then the consequently poorly evaluated um, evidence that comes out when you don't have those data and all subject to the tensions between certainty required to move these vertical programs and the nimbleness and responsiveness sought by um, patients and doctors and activists. So again, if there's time in the discussion, I'm happy to go through this in more detail. Um, and then there are certainly opportunities that we've raised that I've raised in this talk to kind of disrupt this cycle. It doesn't have to be this way. We do have better methods, and those methods can be brought to excuse me, to the data and we can um, limit the use of data to those that allow application of these methods. And we can also change who sits at the table and what the content is um, that's discussed at the table. Um, this is just, I, I just wanted to conclude with this other case that um, is that of a young woman in India, an 18 year old uh, woman in India who um, was called uh, Priya in much of the um, press that her very, very sad case received. So she had, um, again, multiply treated TB like um, Calvin, she had had good compliance with her treatment. Um, but was um, unable to uh, be cured with these treatments and her family sought bedaquiline for her and bedaquiline at the time in 2016 was limited just to six metropolitan areas and metropolitan centers in India and Priya did not live in any of those centers and effectively this this the WHO's decision to reaffirm their conditional recommendation initially made in 2000, 2013, but to reaffirm it in 2016, essentially gave cover to restrictive policies like that in India, which said, oh, we don't want to let this drug get out too widely because it, it might harm people and we don't really know. Um, so Priya was not allowed to receive bedaquiline. Her family filed suit on her behalf. Um, to get bedaquiline, uh, despite not living in one of these um, six cities. Uh, event, and our dear colleague and friend Jen Fern was an expert witness in this case. And eventually, Prio did, um, uh, the decision was made that she was allowed to receive bedaquiline, but sadly, it was too late for Priya. And while, you know, I can't, I can't honestly say that it's the WHO's fault that Priya didn't get um, bedaquiline, it just makes it much easier for countries to um, delay or avoid making innovation available if the, the strength of the recommendations and the, um, are, are, are not there. So just um, in closing, and I think I've probably made most of these points already in, in the course of my talk, it, it's clear to me that, that we do need more resources, for, resources for, for high quality research and research training in TB, and that those much more of that research and, and um, it needs to be led by people who live in places with real palpable risks of TB and, and the very conditions that aggravate those risks of TB. Um, those same individuals need to really have access to data. They, 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 we shouldn't be uh, creating structures where that data is just handed off to other people. Um, and those same individuals really need to um, be able to use the best possible tools to um, uh, exploit those data. Uh, we, we need to um, work harder at some of these um, sustained accompaniment models that would allow patients and practitioners and genuine community leaders to have opportunities to sit at these tables and be informed about and express their appetite for innovation and attendant risk. Um, and these are, you know, opportunities to uh, disrupt this, this cycle of failure to deliver innovation and um, to inject, uh, I, I guess, some, some uh, decolonized global health uh, approaches into the overly prescriptive uh, drug-resistant TB guideline processes. Um, so I have a long list of acknowledgments. Um, I feel like this 
uh, this talk has really been influenced by decades of work with a very, very large group of people um, here at PIH in Haiti and Boston and Liberia. Um, and um, uh, also people outside our, our global health delivery partnership um, circle. And uh, just a special shout out to um, Ali LaHood who helped me um, with some of the um, uh, consolidation of numbers from the WHO guidelines and the, um, the IPD meta-analysis publications. So thank you. Thanks, Carol. That was just a fantastic and rich talk. Um, where, where to start? Uh, well, I think since this is a pro seminar and we're, you know, we're thinking about this in terms of, of how we're viewing social medicine, um, you know, I think what Carol has shown us here is that uh, part of re-socializing medicine is to see how context influences the way we construct a problem and how we can and should construct the solutions that you know that we bring to bear on the problem, and I think you know from our I, I like the way Carol that you 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 dove into the topic, which was showing us that context context means uh, framing this topic within a deep understanding of social history and political economy, and then applying that to thinking about how we are using these different methodologies to address a problem and and the answers that we get from that. So the um, the reason I think that the way you've approached this is 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 important is that I think it it demonstrates uh, a few things. Uh, two that come to mind immediately are that uh, the process of re-socializing um, uh, really should should um, uh, allows us to to think of like instead of blaming a methodology for not being effective. So instead of you looking and saying, well, this whole grade approach or the PICO approach isn't good, you've basically shown how the grade approach and the PICO approach are driven by a certain understanding of health or healthcare delivery. And that in fact, it, it might be mistaken and that there are different ways of, of, of analyzing the data. And in, show doing the, in so doing this, you've actually shown us the second key thing, which is the power of this interdisciplinary approach to answering you know, important questions about caregiving and care delivery. So you know, as I looked at what you were doing, I was thinking no matter how much we wanna use historical and anthropological methods, we're not going to be able to answer the important questions about care delivery for MDRTB without turning to the types of methodologies that you've outlined. And the fact that you outlined the use of the methodology that you were proposing in terms of political economy, in terms of what's actually happening on the ground and what actually happens with patients and what happens in places that aren't running randomized controlled trials and other things, shows us that, that using these methodologies differently can inform uh, the questions in important ways. So I really, uh, you know, I really appreciate appreciate that. And as you were talking um, and looking at your slides, you know, I, I remember being on some of these guidelines committees and just being flabbergasted at the way the questions themselves were being asked. Uh, very narrowly construed in terms of um, of of what data matters. Uh, of course, in the but but the other part is that you know the questions were asked in ways like. Uh, uh, you know, uh, how would you deal with uh, treating X in a resource poor setting, which of course is not a scientific question because it brings in, uh, you know, these questions of resources, which are very fungible. So that's, that's my reflection on, on Carol and what you've said. And, and you, you of course have evoked the, uh, all of this happening at the WHO. And that's something that, that is one of my favorite things to talk about. So for the next five minutes, I wanna just say a few things about that. Um, you know, I, when you start to look at the organizations that are driving, you so policy is happening in a space, and you're you you've really dug deep here into the policymaking process. You've you've gone, uh, you you've looked at the actual process at at, at the at the committee level, and I want to pull back, you know, just for a few reflections, and and think about the the policymaking process writ large. So you. You know, you're 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 talking about the WHO, the World Health Organization, and and it's interesting when we look at its its history. Um, you know, it started in the, I guess, almost at the you could argue the immediate post-colonial period. Um, you know, in in the telling of its history, it, it took over the offices of the League of Nations Health Unit in Geneva, and that unit, in fact, it took over the offices and most of the people, and that unit had been focused on stopping disease from going from the colonial you know, coming from the colonial periphery 
to the colonial metropole. And, um, and that, of course, was driven by the idea that, uh, you know, the, uh, by the idea of colonialism, by international, certain ideas of international health. And the first, the, the first director general of the, um, of the uh, WHO, Brock Chisholm, wanted it to be more than an international uh, health organization. He wanted people to be thinking about the world. Uh, and that's why you know, he fought for it to be called the World Health Organization. And, and he wanted to move beyond the idea of people doing things that would only help their countries and, and that it would actually help everybody. And in fact, he created an oath, which I don't think is necessarily good, but it was an oath that the w, every staff member of the WHO had to take, and they still take till today. Um, and it's interesting. It says, I solemnly swear to exercise in all loyalty, discretion, and, and conscience the functions entrusted to me as an international civil servant of the WHO to discharge these functions and regulate my conduct with the interests of the World Health Organization only in view and not to seek or accept instructions in regard to the performance of my duty from any government or other authority external to the organization. So, you know, the idea of course was that you'd create this entity that was very independent, um, but of course the organization immediately wasn't independent. It was it, because it needed money and it got this money from big donors. It, and namely it got this country, this money from countries that had become very rich in the 18th, 19th and early 20th centuries uh, through uh, you know, extractive policies that were part of colonialism and, and, and other forms of extraction. So um, you know, the dynamics have changed a bit of course. Today we see China and Russia and and even non-state actors like the Gates Foundation playing a role, but we still see that funders have a major role, and and we still see that there are that it doesn't ref, re, you know reflect necessarily what people uh, in the various locales in the world want, um, and this of course leads to a system that lacks accountability, and um, and and I think that what you've described in these kind of uh, the way data is being analyzed and. And, and the way the questions are being asked is an attempt to create some sort of accountability to data. Um, but of course, uh, you know, the, you, you've shown us that you can't even be, uh, you know, that, that in itself has problems. Um, I wanna say that from the very beginning, what you're describing with MDRTB, you see this from the very beginning of TB policy emerging from the WHO. So Christian McMillan, who's written a book on tuberculosis in the 20th century, describes the situation of, of the WHO recommending isoniazid monotherapy for use in, uh, in poor countries. Uh, it brought together a committee that, that uh, of, of actually people who had been working on TB for many years. And in fact, some of the people involved in showing that, uh, that, that you needed to use um, multiple drugs to treat TB or else you'd get drug resistance. But that group, met and they they and 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 almost blind to um, what was going on in the colonies they said you know these countries are poor and they uh, should use eyes and eyes at monotherapy because it's better than nothing and Christian McMillan really brings out how the the, the response was not monolithic uh, there were some people that agreed with it there were some of the the drivers of the policy that agreed with it but he takes the example of the British doctors in Kenya who rebelled and said, no, we're not going to do this because this is just bad policy. You know, he goes into the archives and he and he shows that 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 there was a, a group of people that said this is bad medicine and it's completely wrong. But in fact, that eisenized monotherapy policy continued despite oodles of data till the early 1960s, to mid-1960s, uh, at which point the WHO recommended that even poor countries could use uh, um, could use uh, 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 multi-drug regimens to prevent the development of, of, of MDR-TB. Um, you know, and then as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about the struggle we're currently in, uh, thinking about, about TB preventive therapy. And again, George Comstock showed this in 1957. They showed that, that giving preventive therapy to contacts of TB patients worked to bring down cases and reduce new cases. So bring down rates and reduce new cases. Um, when proposed for poor countries, you know, Comstock presented all his data in 1962 to the WHO Expert Committee, and um, and uh, they basically said that um, that it wouldn't work in poor countries because 
it's not feasible and it's too complicated. So in 1962, when he presented it, he followed people for 20 years. So when he represented the data, so I think it was, sorry, he presented it in 1964. Then when he represented it in 1974, uh, again, they said that having the, this expert committee um, said that, that, uh, that isonide prophylax prophylaxis therapy, which was now being used throughout the Western world, had no place in poor countries. Uh, it was again deemed impractical in 1982. And as you, as everyone here knows, it was not part of the DOT strategy for TB in 1993, again, because it was un, you know, deemed unfeasible. And so, you know, I just think of these li of, of a line uh, that, that, that our friend and colleague and, and coworker, uh, Tom Nicholson, who's the head of advanced access and delivery, you know, said, as we were walking out of a discussion about these policies, you know, the WHO had said that you couldn't use eisenizid prophylaxis therapy in general. Uh, and they said that it, it doesn't make sense for any population that has a rate of TB tuberculosis more than 100 per 100,000. And it doesn't make sense in poor and middle income countries. And of course, in both those cases, that's exactly where you'd want to use it. And, and Tom said, um, this is both anti-poor and anti-sick. <laughs> because it just doesn't make any sense, you know, and there was no explanation. And of course, I could go through example and uh, over example, you know, like looking after uh, x-ray, the same thing with x-ray, the same thing with setting up labs, the same thing with setting up negative pressure rooms in hospital. And, and of course, this always clashed with this idea, this high ideal in the, in the WHO constitution, which a lot of people look to for the highest attainable standard of health as a fundamental right of every human being. But what it does, what it does not clash with, is this idea that that permeates UN documents, and actually permeated colonial documents, as our as our friend and colleague Aaron Shackow has shown us when he looks at you know why you know the the British and and the very gradual move towards uh, self government in India, this this idea called progressive realization that people can't have everything all at once, and that you know you would build up to it uh, at the same you know over time. The time, of course, never being defined and, and of course, giving just a safety valve so that you don't actually have to do anything and you can take as long as you want. So as I look at Carol's uh, presentation, I'm thinking, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking about the nature of these organizations, the nature of, their, of the policies that frame them, things like progressive realization, the historical moment that framed them, colonialism. So while the British doctors are being told, don't use multi-drug therapy for drugs, I mean, for TB, something to which they're rebelling, Britain is, is putting, uh, uh, you know, the Mama Rebellion is going on in Kenya at exactly the same time, and Britain is putting people in uh, concentration camps. And so you start to realize that, the, that this colonial moment is really shaping the thinking, and, you know, that's followed by the, the post-colonial moment. So, you know, when you look at, at what Carol is showing, you think about that, you think about the milieu within which our ideas of science and science as it pertains to what should be done in poor countries is shaped, is, you know, it's framed by that milieu. You also think about gaps in accountability. You know, again, Carol describes this thing where people who are, uh, people are, are meant to talk about their conflict of interests and, and other things that are meant to probably, you know, indicate that there's some level of accountability taking place. But you start to look at the broader picture and you realize that this entire process that she's described, which she's shown us, um, uh, you know, has some flaws, is not accountable to the, to the patients, right? It's not accountable to the people who need the care. And it makes you ask, to whom are these bodies accountable? Um, well, you, we know that the WHO is a technical body is accountable to the ministries of health of the nation states. Um, but there's no accountability for any wrongdoing if these policies are, are made incorrectly or if people die. And, you know, I'm immediately uh, drawn to thinking about uh, something that we talk about in our class a little bit, uh, you know, our social medicine class, which is the work of Hannah Arendt, who is one of the great political philosophers of the 20th century. You know, in one of her books uh, called The Human Condition, she talks about how when you diffuse this accountability, and of course here we're seeing it diffused in committees and in, in all these processes, you end up getting the, you know, the rule by no, nobody so that you can't put a finger on who's making these decisions or who's deciding what, what, what approaches should be used and who's deciding what methodologies will be accepted and won't. And, um, and basically, 
Aaron points out that it's very hard to point a finger at one person in this kind of intricate system. And she argues that that's the most tyrannical situation you can find yourself in because there's no single person that can answer for, answer for what's being done. It leads to uh, a moral unaccountability. So, you know, I just want to end that, you know, with, with that and say that as we're looking at the processes that Carol has described, the processes through which bureaucracies are able to put these policies in place and are forced to address the questions of whether they're truly able to do, you know, we are forced to address the, the question of whether they're truly able to do what, they're what they claim that they're doing. You know, we're asked to confront, I think, here as a, as a social medicine department, um, and as many uh, have done before us, how this neutral uh, scientific data, how neutral is it? And, and, and how neutral are the processes through which they're analyzed and vetted and accepted? So thank you, Carol, for really a fantastic uh, uh, discussion. And I'm gonna end there. I've gone a bit over time. We should probably open up for, for questions and thoughts from others. Okay, so I hope everyone will join me in thanking Salman and, and Carol for those provocative talks. There are a number of ways in which you can ask questions if you want. One is to put it in the chat, and Marty and I will keep an eye on that uh, and call on people to ask their questions. Or you can, in the participants tab, uh, use the raise hand features to raise your blue hand, and we will call on you that way. But while people are thinking of their questions, I want to ask two quick questions, although they could have long answers. So try to keep the answer short, one for each of you. <coughs> Carol, to what extent uh, are you worried? I think you're proudly of being accused of being a, a heretic against the uh, religion of RCTs. You know, Scott and I have, have periodically published pieces in historical literature that will claim that RCTs are not the be all and end all. Uh, and that will call down the wrath of God on us uh, by people who are the RCT believers who think that anything other than an RCT is an insidious force that will destroy medical knowledge. And in your talk, you said, you know, RCTs are not the be all and end all. So I wonder what kind of arguments you have had with the RCT purists and how you respond to their desire to defend the dogma. <clears throat> and then Salman, the, what do you think is driving this desire not to treat people? All right, Carol may have thoughts about this as well. Is it racism and that, you know, these are powerful white people who are making decisions that don't make access, treatment available for black and brown people worldwide? Is it self-interest? They want to keep the, the drugs available so they can treat themselves when they get sick? Or is there something else going on that makes so many of these people over so many decades willing to withhold treatment from people who would benefit from it? Thanks, David. And thanks, Salman. I really um, appreciate your, your reflections. I, I, I knew they would be um, wonderful and, and really informative and providing a, a, an even um, better context for some of my observations. Um, so, David, I, as you can imagine, I have been involved in many of those discussions and I am still running clinical trials and I still very much value the, qual the, the quality and type of evidence that comes from those trials. But first of all, not every question is best answered by a trial. And second of all, there aren't enough trials going on to uh, be able to answer all of our questions. Um, many people will talk about the resources available for trials. To me, that's sort of a cop out. Yes, yes, we do need more, but that's, that's not a reason. Uh, sorry, yes, there's not enough money, but that's not a reason not to do trials when questions are really best answered by trials. I think my argument and, and, and that of, of many, many of my colleagues in these fora is that um, one kind of in the meantime, there are, there are many other sources of data when um, managed correctly and, and um, analyzed correctly can provide really good information about some of these very specific questions about the type of treatment and the duration of treatment and the contribution of individual drugs. They should still be ideally confirmed by trials when, when the questions are of that nature, but there's lots of room for both. And then the other part of that is that um, clinical trials really are most suitable for those kinds of questions. The, you know, very specific, what is the better treatment type of question, or is it safe 
type of question. But there are many other questions that are plaguing our, our ability to deliver care um, and innovation that could be addressed through other types of research and analysis. Um, you know, that your, your second question um, points to some of those in, in really understanding what is valued and, and what are the priorities of different players in this field. I think you'd get really different answers from patients and patient activists and you know, nurses in a provincial uh, healthcare facility in South Africa, then you're going to get, say, from national TB program directors and um, people in the global TB program at, at the World Health Organization. And I, I think some of what you're going to get from that latter group is just an explicit um, priority placed on things more like protecting the drugs. So this is one of the things we've heard about bedaquiline and delaminid when we first when they first came out the code word was they should only there should only be rational use and rational use of bedaquiline and delaminid meant exactly the same thing that that Croft and Cholet and Maher said in the in the 1997 guidelines which was that their use should be restricted to specialized centers that are really only going to exist in in capitals of poor countries at best and more likely in you know upper middle income or high income countries. So that's one of the things that I think um, goes into this. Uh, a second issue is the um, um, is the um, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought because other things were were running through my head. Um, the there there are um, um, obviously, I think some of the, the other uh, sequela of, of colonialism definitely play into this. And I think Hana, um, I think um, Salman's um, evocation of Hannah Arendt's, um, sorry, no, it wasn't the Hannah Arendt, but the, the, sorry, the progressive realization concept. I do think there has been a lot of that in that um, it, it's almost these, these innovations are perceived as a, as a reward for doing good at a lower, at a lower level of TB control or TB services, rather than seeing that all of these resources are needed, all of these innovations are needed to actually improve the, the health of a population. Um, and I'll let someone come in on that too. Well, thanks, Carol. You know, I, I think, Carol, you raised a few really good points here. You know, the, so this idea of stewardship that Carol talks about, so that, you know, the, the, the people don't want to use new antibiotics because they want to, they want to save them. And I guess the automatic question one asks, and of course it's couched within antibiotic stewardship. So people say there's so much drug resistance in the world. We have to be good stewards of this antibiotic. Therefore we need to save it for the worst cases. Right? So you say save for whom? Because there's 500,000 people who have MDRTB globally and about 20% of them get care. And although uh, you, you don't, you, the numbers aren't reflecting what the WHO says, we know that for those that don't get proper care or fail treatment, about 80% of them die. We know that from, from, from our project in Russia and other places. So you start to look at this and say, well, if you've got a disease that's going to kill 80% of people, you want to give them these antibiotics as quickly as possible. So, but the steward, and, and in fact, good stewardship in that setting would be to get the right antibiotics to the right people as quickly as possible. But the stewardship is, is reframed as being saving it for and I'm just gonna finish the sentence in a very cynical way, saving it for when it's needed in richer countries and we don't wanna lose it, right? So that's, that. I think the stewardship thing is another whole, uh, you know, whole uh, discussion. Um, this thing of, of reward. So, you know, when, on the Green Light Committee, I, I think I, I've never used the word reward, but I think Carol has put it beautifully. So we would have these, these programs that had drug resistance and people said, drug resistance emerges from bad TB programs. We cannot let people have access to MDR TB drugs if they're running a bad program. Therefore, we have to fix their program. And when they fixed it, they can have access to low price MDR TB drugs. I mean, literally this was viewed as a reward, right? Now, if you start to dissect that, you have to ask yourself, is any of this true? So it turns out that, that programs, good and bad, one of the best DOTS programs in the world was the Peruvian program, which had tons of MDRTB. 
And you see that all around the world. People were doing DOTS and it didn't work. And why didn't it work? Because it didn't involve active case finding. It didn't involve treatment of latent TB. It didn't involve all for, you know, uh, uh, the, the, it didn't involve a diagnostic for, for drug resistance, which was known you know, since the first TB drug was given, et cetera, et cetera. So you realize, oh my God, like it's not because of bad programs. And you realize from the first British Medical Research Council survey of drug resistance in 1955, where they found drug resistance to drugs that had been on the market, you know, literally for two or three or four years, that, that there was always going to be drug resistance. We had known this since the 1940s. So, you know, you realize that this whole framing of even the reward pathway is completely wrong. Like you're rewarding people for, for something that they have no control over. Um, and then Paul Farmer, of course, uses this amazing term, condition for scarcity on behalf of others. So is it, you know, David, you asked the question, is it racism? You know, it's easy to look at this pattern and say, well, we left extractive colonialism, which dovetailed really well with extractive neoliberalism. And it seems to affect predominantly countries that are, are brown and black. So is it racism? I'm, I'm, I I'm want to say that it's not, I, I think I'm not saying that ideas of race don't play a role, but I think it's deeper than that. I think there are many well-meaning people who have devoted their lives to trying to do this, um, who are stuck in this amber of, of thinking that uh, in this very developmental pathway, uh, this idea that you go from not having a well-developed mind to being more well-developed. That was the whole reason, you know, the British said, we'll give independence to India as they develop X, Y, and Z. You know, uh, Jan Smuts, who wrote the preamble to the UN said, you know, the, the African has a child type, right? So this whole idea of it being developmental. So I think people are stuck in that pathway. And we saw that pathway being, being played out with white Americans that, that people in the early 20th century considered imbecilic, you know, worthy of being sterilized, etc. So, you know, I don't want to tie it completely to race. I think there is a racial aspect to it. Um, but even if we don't tie it to, to, to race, I think there's something pernicious about um, the way this conditioning for scarcity then defines what we're willing to do vis-a-vis -vis stewardship, vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis reward, vis-a-vis -vis access. And Carol's talking about badaquilin and delaminate. But Eklund is made by Johnson Johnson. Otsuka, uh, the dilemma is made by Otsuka. Both produce other drugs. They don't distribute any of their other drugs through these pathways, the centralized node of control at the WHO. For the rest of their entire drug portfolios, they distribute it through distributors and the market. So I think there's a deeper question for which I can't, I don't have the answer right now as to why we've allowed the centralized node of control to dominate in TB, but not in HIV, not in uh, cholesterol management, not in anything else. And maybe you and Scott have a better answer for that, but it's, it's really quite curious. Well, Scott did have a follow-up question. He had, he had to run to an appointment. Uh, so I will try to channel his, his question, which again, will follow up to, to both of you. Uh, he said, from the point of view of the historians, RCTs uh, have been a means, have been introduced as a means to tame the commercial marketplace. This goes back to the Kefauer Harris amendments and concerns about pharma's misbehavior with antibiotics in the 1950s. Um, so, another group of people that have an interest in weakening the grip of RCTs on knowledge production, of course, is industry. And you can see this in the 21st century CARES Acts and the right to use and all those things that the Trump administration has pushed through. Um, and so Scott says, how does Carol mediate between what may seem industry interest in profiting from alternative means of assessment versus more public health focused rationales for such alternative assessments? Uh, on the one hand, I mean, you, can, you can say that, yes, we're taking the moral high ground here by saying people should have access to these drugs. Um, but that's also industry interest potentially in doing so. So how, how do you navigate between those competing public health and industry interests? Um. I, I think it's a really interesting question, David, and 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 we we get a lot of um, a lot of kind of pushback 
on this as well from the leading um, entity that's a technically a private public partnership in TB drug development, the Global Alliance for TB Drug Development. And when um, there are, uh, when they are pressed by activists and others to um, have higher quality data or to um, introduce like compassionate use programs earlier in their development program or um, other ways of, of improving um, the, the knowledge base for innovation, they push back by saying, if you guys keep asking for these things, nobody's gonna get involved in TB drug development. And there's already nobody involved in TB drug development. It's not a profitable area. And this just further alienates you know, potentially interested manufacturers. And I guess that, you know, our, our answer has to be that even if what, what we're advocating for happens to have collateral benefits to industry, I think if there are structures in place that make sure that the, the users of those, those innovations are, are really truly informed about their risks and benefits, then okay, then there's this ancillary, this ancillary benefit to industry and maybe it would lead to more, more development of anti-TB drugs. I mean, obviously that's not the objective that we're pursuing, but um, if it's an unintended consequence, I, I think I can I can sleep at night. And and David, you know, I'm glad Carol used the word risk, and I want to build you know build on this idea of risk, right? Like so, this, you know, again, we go back to the social construction of risk, right? So what what's at risk? So I we talked about the stewardship thing where people say that the drugs are at risk versus the half a million people that are at risk of dying, right? Eighty percent of whom will die. So so there's that risk that's being mis apportioned, let's just say. Um, there's another risk that's being misapportioned, and that is that, um, you know, when we look at cancer drugs, we often say, well, um, uh, cancer drugs, you know, people are going to die. This cancer is going to kill them, and therefore, we're going to allow people to use these drugs very early on uh, in, in the development of, of, of the drugs. And so some work, some don't, you see some crazy side effects, but the thought is, well, these people are going to lose their lives. So we should do everything we can to save them. With TB, it's weird, but it's the opposite. So we know that people are gonna die, that 80% are gonna die in four or five years. We know that, that they're gonna, before they die, they're gonna transmit it to their families and their communities, right? And yet we, we have this situation where we say, well, um, uh, the drug Carol was talking about, bedaquiline, the resistance that the WHO put out to it being widely used was they said a very small percentage of people get QT prolongation. So they're, they're, they're cardiac, uh, they'll get a cardiac arrhythmia uh, for those that don't know about QT. So they'll get QT prolongation and therefore it's too risky to be used unless you do X, Y, and Z and they created this whole thing. And this for a disease that's gonna, like if you don't get treatment, you are gonna die. And your family members are going to die. And just to put this into perspective, if you have XDRTB, your chance of death right now in the world, if you get treatment, uh, I mean, just sorry, statistically, is between 10 and 20 percent will survive, and, and 80 to 90 percent will die. Will die. Okay. And if you're a contact of a drug resistant or uh, XDR patient, okay, one in 10 contacts gets disease. So one in 10 contacts will be subject to that same 80% or 90% death rate, okay? That means that eight to 9% of contacts, people just standing near the index case are gonna get it, are gonna die. So when you start to think about this and you put these statistics into, into like real risk, you realize what is that compared to the very small chance that somebody's gonna have a cardiac arrhythmia if they receive this medicine? Now, you know, you, you, bring up, you bring up the fact that some of these risk issues have been abused in the past, that there have been cases where people have falsely said a drug is good or bad, or, or you know, has said that it's, you know, a company has said, oh, you can use it for this when it's not actually some of the registered things. There are many things that can go wrong, but in this specific case example, 
as Carol says, we could live with taking increased risk on behalf of patients who will die if they don't get it. So I don't feel like, you know, pharma, they, I look at these pharma companies, I remember one of the companies came to us and said, you know, in our first run of, uh, of, of drug, how many, how, many, how many courses should we make? And I, at that time, had finished being GLC chair a couple of years before, and I said, there's 500,000 patients. There's 100,000 that receive care. You should make like 20 or 30 or 50,000 courses because everybody's going to be clamoring for your drug. And they said, we've been told by the WHO and other partners that we should make 500 courses for the 500,000 potential cases. And I said, that would be... <laughs> crazy. That would be criminal. I mean, you're the first new drug in like almost 50 years. Oh, don't do that. That would be crazy. They made like 10 or 20 or 30,000 courses and they sold almost none. They sold 300 and something in the first two or three years. And then they had to give away 30,000 courses for free through USAID just to, just because they couldn't, they couldn't sell the drug. They couldn't sell the first new anti-TB drug in 50 years. So this doesn't. This is not a market that's operating according to the same, you know, uh, 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 things that drive regular markets where the cons that you're talking about do exist. This is doesn't seem to be that market. It's very anomalous. I see Arthur has his hand up. You're on mute, Arthur. I thought it were two wonderful presentations. Um, the only point I was going to make is all knowledge is socially constructed. I'm going back to the title. All knowledge is socially constructed. So for the title, um, in future, we should have, and, and for pro seminars like this that are trying to build our knowledge base in, in uh, social medicine, it should be either the social misconstruction of knowledge or the dangerous social construction of knowledge. But it isn't like there's some kind of knowledge that isn't socially constructed. Um, our astrophysical knowledge is socially constructed. Our, our, our molecular biological knowledge is socially constructed. It also happens to be co-constructed by, bio, by the biological processes themselves. But on the social side, we should acknowledge that. And I, I think the real term is probably social misconstruction. Because this is an example, this, this was a wonderful presentation on social misconstruction. And then we can ask the question, why the, why the social misconstruction? And I thought that, um, that Salman's use of Paul's idea of socialization for scarcity is really critical here. Um, uh, I've always wondered myself, you know, if you look across the university, the most difficult group to deal with in my experience, in terms of qualitative data versus quantitative data, are not physicists, are not mathematicians, are not um, chemists. Um, they're public health people. And I've often wondered about that. Why, why, why do the basic scientists have, have very little trouble with this? They themselves recognize that much of the, what they do is to generate qualitative data. Why is it that the public health people uh, who are in some sense the least scientific of the group, but the most technologically um, using or, or programmatically using quantitative data. Why are they the most concerned? And it gets me back to a, what I think, and I've written about, is this uh, deep value structure that Solomon was looking for. And, um, and I think it goes like this. That it's very, I'll put it crudely uh, because it's the only way I can think about it. I'm sure there's a sophisticated way of doing this. There are a limited number of resources in the world. There are many, many sick people. How do we know that we get the right resources to the right people? And the only way we know that is through controlled clinical trials and other bureaucratically structured quantitative measures. And I think that, the, that this is exactly the scarcity issue. Um, and so that the best way to engage it is just the two of you have engaged it from the standpoint of the values built into it. Um, anyway, I, I just 
I thought, you know, if we, I, I know we record these, but I think we should ask all of our students to listen to this se session and be maybe take an exam on it. Because this is, this is the best presentation I think I've heard that shows the social misconstruction of quantitative data. Thank you. Thanks very much, Arthur. Well, well, well taken on the um, on the topic, and I'll I'll credit my time in the Department of Social Medicine for overcoming my my public health training. Tolman, any last comments before we sign off? No, I think Arthur summed it up well. Thank you, Arthur. Is, is it, well, th thank you uh, both for those excellent talks, and for Arthur and others for your comments and discussion on this. Uh, as I put in the chat. Uh, our department lecture series will continue next week. Uh, the, in the usual global health and social medicine seminar series, we will have a talk about diabetes in Africa. And then this social medicine pro seminar will reconvene in two weeks uh, with Mary Bassett and Jean Richardson talking about race, class, gender, and redistributive justice. Uh, so thank you all for coming and I look forward to seeing you in the next two weeks. Thank you, David. Thanks, David. Thanks, Thanks David. Thanks, Salman, Marty. Yeah. Thanks, David. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, that was just fantastic. I really enjoyed that. Thanks, David. Thank you, Carol. Thanks. Great to see everyone. Glad you're here, Nani Congratulations, Carol. Thank you so much, Arthur. Thanks for your support. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful presentation, Carol. And so on. Thanks, Hansel. It's so good to see you. Appreciate it. If you allow me, uh, you, you know, you know I, I echo your thoughts, Carol, at the macro level, the, the way how you presented it. And I have seen this. I am a